<clears throat> All right, everybody. Let's do this. Oh, and also, um, if you guys want to um, chime in at any point, let me go ahead and please do, because I'm going to be talking about um, the, the gods of old today, everybody. We're talking about the gods of old. And I know especially Leonard has a lot to say in it, and I know everybody has some input. So if you want to have a discussion with that, I would love it. And um, please confirm that you can see my screen. You can, can you see my screen okay, guys? Yeah, I can, uh, I can see your screen. Okay. So this is a part of a longer presentation that also goes around three hours called Origin Stories or Creation Stories of Ancient Civilizations. But I'm picking up over here because specifically today we're going to be talking about the gods of old, the Greek gods, the Egyptian god connection, uh, and India. But in order to do it, like I love to do my presentations, is really to create a foundation first before we go into that. So we're going to start off with this slide. I think it's a good slide to start with. Hinduism 101, right? This is talking about, obviously, the religion that comes out of India all the way on uh, the other side of the world from where I'm at, not the natives of the U.S. So Hinduism 101. Well, we know that it, it incorporates many religious ideas and philosophies. For this reason, it's sometimes referred to as a way of life or family of religions. Hinduism was never really considered a religion until the uh, basically when the British went over there and the shifts that occurred within the religion over time, it became less of a philosophy moving out of the Vedic age and then became more of a religious um, kind of you know organized religion. Also, originally, many of the deities and um, the gods and concepts were metaphors on how to live life over time thousands of years later it became almost like these gods were were even more personified as external beings and the messages of internal truth kind of got lost to time so that's how we move from vedic awareness which is the vedic age which predates hinduism in ancient india that i'm going to get into in a moment here and then we get into the religious age that eventually becomes organized religion and eventually becomes even more um, bastardized for lack of a better way to explain it when the invasions happen with the uh, Mongolians and especially the Khans and the um, Islamic people imposing their view on Hindus of the Indians at the time. So most forms of Hinduism worship a single deity known as Brahman but still recognize other gods and goddesses. A lot of people think it's a polytheistic religion. Most Indians would not believe it is because they believe that there's one source creator and every other one is just a frac basically a fractal creation of that one source. So it's kind of like, it's kind of both really. So followers believe there are multiple paths to reaching God consciousness. Living creatures have a soul and an Atman. This part of the philosophy is that living creatures have a soul or an Atman and they're all part of the Supreme Soul. The goal is to achieve moksha, which is liberation, or salvation, which ends the cycle of rebirths to become part of the absolute soul. Hinduism is closely related to other Indian religions, including Buddhism, Sikhism, Christianity, Zoroastrian, and Greek mythology. Now, Buddhism and Sikhism directly came from Hinduism in the in the fact that, you know, Buddha was Hindu. The Sikh um, prophets, all but one of them were Hindu. And then Christianity, there's a huge connection too, and that also connects to Buddhism. And then the Greek mythology is the is the part that we're going to dive into in just a moment here. So being Indian myself, I have often wondered, you know, how old is India and this Vedic awareness? I hear a lot of information about, you know, the Himalayas protected India for quite some time. And it protected India to uh, the point that many warring tribes tried to invade India, but India remained in isolation for, you know, we already know that that's happened even within the last hundred years with China. Alexander the Great didn't really get that far into India. So it's, this Himalayas have really been a, a, a barrier between the rest of the world. So growing up, learning about um, Hinduism, going to like these schools that my parents took me to for Hinduism and culture and also singing hymns, right? I was told things like, you know, ancient India Vedic awareness is 5,000 to 10,000 years old. Then I was told um, other um, things like India 
the ancient Indians go back a hundred thousand years. And so I'm trying to quantify this in my head and be like, okay, so the people say that the Vedic awareness is actually hundreds of thousands of years old. So as I was learning this, I realized that um, when I started learning more and more, right, about the cycles of time, the 13,000 year cycles, um, the 26,000 year cycle of the Yuga cycle, that you go from the dark ages to the gold, bronze age to the silver age to the gold age. So I'm thinking a hundred thousand years, how can, we would have we've gone through so many cycles in that last 100,000 years of devolution and evolution how is it that india lasted for that much time with all this other stuff happening on the planet plus if anunnaki happened and all these things how, how could it happen so this speak um, piqued my interest in a, a lifelong journey on the exploration of what the true dating of india is and so modern india today baby hold on my wife is here baby i'm here okay so modern India today is um, combined of many ancient cultures, right? So I would say that modern makeup of Indians, like myself, um, kind of can be split into two categories, North India and South India. And the reason why I say that is that even though this like ethnic connection to the South Indians and the North Indians, the North Indians seem to have a more um, influence from other ethnicities, other ancient cultures. And the reason for that is that many civilizations like that came to conquer India, they would come into India and they couldn't even make it more than halfway or even a quarter of the way down because India is so massive that they did not get to populate the whole of India, some of them. So most of the uh, hybridization, if you will, between different cultures occurred in the North. And m myself being a North Indian, I, from my research, I realized that there's a chance that my makeup is you know, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian, because I'm gonna get into that too, how there's a connection to ancient Egypt, which is called Kemet, because Egypt was a name given by the Greeks, by the way, the real name is Kemet. Um, Kush, the land of Kush, which is also a Sanskrit word for happy, um, which is in Africa. The Aryans from Persia, and then Mongolians. I mean, I think almost everybody in the world has some Mongolian in them. And the migration to the Hindu Kush Valley, which is an area I'll show you on a map in a second, created the Indus civilization around 2900 BCE. So we know that the, the beginning of the Indus civilization in that what created modern day Indians in India, the beginning of it all started around 2900 BC. So, and eventually they migrated south into India, but the Indus civilization was north of India. Uh, in those times when India first got populated in, you know, just after 2900 BC, the whole of Afghanistan, portions of Iraq um, and th two or three other countries were all a part of India. India was much bigger than it is now, maybe one and a half to almost one and three quarters the size that it is right now. So the Indus Valley really was kind of coming um, down through the south part of Afghanistan and into Pakistan. So the they um, it was thought that after 2900 BCE, when this place was um, populated in the Indus civilization started sprouting, seemingly out of nowhere, people couldn't find for a long time how they kind of came into being and had this advanced awareness there. But the, the Vedas, which are the precursor to the Hindu um, texts and the Hindu Bible and the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata and all that, the Vedas were thought to be written around a thousand years later. So it seems that maybe around 3000 BCE to around 2000 BCE, we had uh, a lot of philosophies being shared in that area. and. Um, the philosophies had a lot to do with how, our connection to source information, maybe ancient extraterrestrial information, um, and all the cultures that had contributed to that new civilization that sprouted up over there. So after that, around a thousand years later, it started being put down into actual doctrine where they were creating scriptures that were guides on how to live life. Four different Vedas were created. So now to track the migration of India. So this is a map of human migration out of Africa. And there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I don't want to concentrate on everything. I want you to follow my cursor if possible and take a look at this area right down here. You see, let's start at Egypt. We can all look at Egypt. Now go down to the arrow furthest down, all the way over here, right? So this area right here, Egypt was much bigger as well. It actually 
Um, you know, Egypt was around for thousands of years. And if you believe like people like Robert Schock, 13,000 years. If you believe people like Billy Carson, 36,000 years, you know, and it's, sometimes it goes back even further. So during that time, it expanded and it decreased in size. And at one point, it incorporated the land of Kush. The land of Kush is a civil, was a civilization right down here where this arrow is, right? Where this arrow is right here. And Egypt and Kush would be you know, sometimes at peace, sometimes it's a part of the same empire. Sometimes um, Kush was warring against Egypt. Sometimes the Nubian um, people, in which there are a lot of Nubian pyramids, I highly recommend you searching it out on the internet and seeing those, would join forces with the Kush. And at one point, these Egyptians that were really had the same culture, the same ancestry, uh, and different ones as well, but definitely were connected to the Egyptians, and some of the Egyptians that were there in outposts, went ahead and left that land and started migrating this way. And you can see his Saudi Arabia Peninsula, his Yemen, I believe that's Yemen, and this arrow right here, we're following it, migrated here, migrated here, migrated here, went across the ocean, went into this area right here, and then, boom, this line is the in this civilization, the, in this, and this is the beginning of the Hindu Kush Valley, what's known as the Hindu Kush Valley. The Hindu Kush Valley goes all the way around India into parts of China and other countries. So over here, we see the sprouting of the civilization. There seem to be people from Egypt, the land of Kush, coming over here, migrating, going over the, um, the seas and basically starting a civilization over here. So what did they bring with them? They brought all this information with them from Egypt, from Kush, ancient information. And if you believe in Atlantis, then you believe that Egypt was an outpost of Atlantis in the final days and had all that information as well, including the, their, their philosophy, their spirituality. So after being there for around a thousand years and setting up shop, they eventually, um, they eventually began creating what we know as the Vedas. And here's a, a better map here. So now we got Egypt. This is current day Egypt and the borders, right? And then we have Kush down here. And as I said, you know, obviously the Nile goes through Kush as well. Pyramids all along here. So these were once a part of the same civilization, sometimes not. Then this civilization leaves, goes across the sea. Very interesting that the word Kush means happy in, in um, Sanskrit. And here's the smoking gun for me as well as just everything I told you is verifiable fact as well now, even though it wasn't for some time and it took a lot to pull these dots together because there really isn't this information I'm giving you now in one place on the internet. I had to find it from so many places and it took me third, like literally maybe 25 years of trying to think about it to even figure out how to express this. And so we have them over here going over in the Kush Valley. So not only was the land of Kush, the area of Egypt that left, but the civilization and the area that was named over here was called the Hindu Kush Valley by the same people. The reason why is because they came from the land of Kush. Now, here's an interesting point. Uh, the first type of um, one of the oldest strains, actually one of the original strains of cannabis called Hindu Kush started in this area in the Hindu Kush Valley 2900 BC. Before that, cannabis was not anywhere else in the world it was just in china in china up for twenty thousand years cultivated in china for twenty thousand years then it moved down to the indus kush valley and through these individuals that moved up here and over here they began the first ever cultivation cultivation of cannabis which is why hashish and cannabis is such an important role in hindu scriptures when it comes to bung for the for shiva and when it comes to afghanistanis and um the Arab nations in those areas known, known for their hash. So that was happening at the same time. And then it went out to the rest of the world. So back to the story. Okay, so we have the Hindu Kush Valley and then we have a civilization that pops up in this area. And here's the civilization. And what was the name of one of the city states there? Mohenjo-daro, you may have heard of it. So Mohenjo-daro was one of the first places that was created in this Indus civilization started around 2600 BC. So w within one to 200 years after the, um, after the uh, inhabit inhabiting that area from the people from Egypt and from Kush. Now I'm gonna take a little pause here. I'm gonna show you some images of Mahindradara and Kush, just so I can show you how the valley looks. 
So here we go. Here is an image. of the Hindu Kush Valley. So we see here Afghanistan, right? So this is basically the Indus civilization was a little bit to the left of this as well, but this is just specifically talking about the Hindu Kush Valley. This is where the cannabis was cultivated. This is the name that was named after the land of Kush. This is the place where Kush actually means happy in Sanskrit. And that's why the cannabis was called Kush because he used to smoke it and he made them what? Happy. So that's why that's the whole connection to that word right there. And then, so we have them over here in this, uh, in this area. And this is the whole Hindu Kush Valley that wrapped around this area. That was basically the first areas that was inhabited by these individuals from Mahindradaro. Now, here are some images of Mahindradaro. Here's one right here of his temple structure. And here are a few images that were taken in the past. So here's one. These are old images, right? Panoramic view. Look at all these skeletons petrified into the ground. Anil, those are, uh, as uh, Dr. Sam was talking about this, uh, Mahendradaro yesterday, and uh, he said that uh, when they ran the uh, Geigo meter over them, they discovered that uh, these uh, skeletons were uh, heavily uh, radiated. Radiated, so yeah. That was my next thing. So this is actually, this skeleton right here is actually glass because it's been burned at such a high heat and petrified by probably some nuclear fallout. So it looks like that this civilization could have reached some levels of advancement that, and then were taken out through nuclear weaponry. It's a possibility. That's glass? that's glass, Neil? Yeah, so that's the thing. And Billy Carson wow. does a whole presentation on it that... Um, it's like almost, not, right? not, Yeah, not all of the bones, but a lot of them, especially some on staircases, were like petrified as glass into it so if you walk on it some of it if some of them are completely flat some of them are just petrified actual bones you know what, like what, what year did they say this happened so okay oh. they they don't know the year the only year that is given is a convention a conventional number right so they have it over here uh let's see yeah, 1892. Yeah, <laughs> right. right so so yeah, they're vitrified that's crazy yeah, yeah. So, and here we go. Here is Mohenjo-daro, current Mohenjo-daro. So let's zoom out and show you exactly where we're at. Yeah, you know, I uh, I connect with this site because I have heritage. Yeah. Uh, that goes to uh, Pakistan. Uh, my dad is from oh, yeah. uh, a city called uh, Lahore. Yeah. Uh, just uh, north, uh, I believe northeast. Uh, Mohenjo-daro is. I don't think it's that far from. Uh, so that's right here. Uh, Pakistan is right here. That's right there. But actually, all Indians from India have ancestry from Mahindradara. So we're all yeah. related. You know what I mean? Because like, yeah, they, you and I are related. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. So, okay. So let me tell you this story then. First of all, here we go. Here is this the land of Kush. This whole land was like occupied by the Egyptian empire. This is where they went through. They went through Yemen all the way through here over this ocean. Boom. Ended up here. Created the civilization. Wrapped all around into Nepal, into China, created a great civilization. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden um, something happened. And it seemed like different tribes were coming from elsewhere. Some say there was wars that took place. And obviously we see the um, um, the remnants of radiation. And some say that the, the Aryan Persians from Iran migrated down south, which is what happened as well at one point forcing a lot of people that were left in Mahindradaro to move down south. And a lot of these Aryans might, um, integrated with the Mahindradaro culture and then went into North India, into Pakistan, into Punjab and the Delhi area. So my story is that I actually um, went and got my ancestry done a few years ago and I was interested in learning part of like, you know, do I have Egyptian blood in me, like a DNA, like is it connected somehow, can I figure it out? And then when I got my results back, I got back that I was 99.999% Indian <laughs> and I was 0.0001% Polynesian Island, but anything over 0.01% could be a fluke. So I'm pretty much 100% Indian. So I was like, that's interesting. 
Interesting you say that because, yeah. uh, you know, I uh, spoke to my dad and, uh, you know, he used to uh, tell me that uh, our some great, 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 great uh, grandcestor uh, left uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, went to Iran and then from Iran uh, landed in, uh, in India and then uh, ended up uh, settling uh, in uh, a little city called uh, Rabul Pindi, and then uh, from there they uh, migrated to uh, to Lahore. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, you know, interesting you were okay. making that connection earlier. You know, and I can attest to that that yes. my family comes from that uh, Middle Eastern area that moved into uh, into uh, India. And the story goes was that uh, he was part of an army uh, that uh, that was going over there. And mm -hmm. then when he landed there, he fell in love with the area and the people and uh, decided to uh, abandon the military and just ended up staying there. Wow. So now we're talking about, I'm glad you brought that up because there was two migrations of uh, people from Iran to India. There was one around maybe 2000 BCE, 1000 BCE, and there was one within the last 100 to 200 years in which the Parsi people moved to India and they stayed there and now they're basically Iranian Persian people, but they speak Hindi and they live there. And actually um, the lead singer of uh, Queen, um, no, no, Queen, Freddie Mercury, Freddie Mercury. he's, yeah. he's um, actually Iranian, he's got the same ancestry as you. He's Iranian from Iran. Parents went to India, um, stayed there, became the Parsi people that were from Iran in India. That's a different thing that, that happened hundred years ago. Farsi? F -A -R -S -I. Parsi, Parsi, Parsi with a P. Parsi, okay, because up in Afghanistan, they uh, one of the dialects that they speak is called uh, Farsi, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, yes. the language that's uh, spoken in Iran. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay, so now here we go. Here's Mohenjo-Daro, and here's a town of Harappa, which is, Harappa was actually the capital. Mohenjo-Daro was like also a great city there, but Harappa was the capital of this Indus civilization. And um, Harappa actually has, and if you ever look at my Sound and Vibration Ancient Civilizations presentation on my website, I do a whole 20 minutes on Harappa, where I show you the, the ancient pillars there that are vibrating different frequencies of the solfagio tones that are completely made of solid rock and they don't know how it's doing it. That's based out of Harappa, just to kind of double down on the technology that they had. All right, so now we got, um, here's some more migration images. Now I'm talking about the, this is located again right here. You see what these arrows are? This is conventional migration maps, guys, and it, it verifies everything I'm saying. So here we have the Mohenjo-Daro civilization, and what's going on here? We have all these these people from the Caucasus Mountains, these Aryan people that may not even be the same ancestry as modern day Iranians. This is so long ago, so many tribes have gone through it. They may even have very small. So when I say Iranians from Iran, we don't even specifically need to be talking about the same bloodline and DNA of the people that are currently there. So they moved down and you know, yes, these are the Aryans, the same Aryans that are connected to um, Caucasian people and all over the world. They moved into Mohenjo-Daro, forcing a migration down south into India, and now we have the population, um, India being populated. Okay, so moving on here, we're gonna go into the Vedic origin story, and then we're gonna do some comparisons with Greek and Indian mythology. Vedic origin story. Well, there is no one origin story in the Hindu texts. The period when the Vedas were composed became known as the Vedic period and lasted about 1500 BCE to 500. Rituals such as sacrifices and chanting were common. And what had happened is that um, in the beginning stages, it was really philosophical and very um, spiritually oriented. As time progressed, um, the Hindu culture, though the Vedic culture started becoming really contractual and ritualistic, that if I do this and this and this, God will give me this. And now Hinduism today is a product of that with a lot of truths, a lot of philosophies, a lot of wisdom, but completely contractual. If I do this for you, you will do this for me. If I give you this, then you can give me this. If I fast for you on this day, then my husband will be okay tomorrow. That's kind of where it's become. So there are many similar stories throughout the Vedas. Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita show up in many other scriptures. In Hinduism, it is more common to find origin stories per deity that in many cases symbolizes the origin of what that being represents. So instead of one origin story, like many have, and even though you could argue that Indians have that too in regards to the creation of the universe, but um, there's many origin stories per deity, like Agni, for example, which is the god of fire. 
and Agni actually means fire in Hindi. And the same, the same goes for Greek mythology, where each of the gods also have their origin stories. In Hinduism, Brahma is an impersonal force. All of creation is within it. All deities are manifestations within it, which is why it's almost like a monotheistic, polytheistic religion. <laughs> and you know how I love the paradox. So that's the paradox right there. And then we got Trinity, uh, which is the Trinity that we see almost everywhere, especially in what is known as Christianity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And this is a connection to Christianity, even though there's very many connections to Christianity. Um, we have the Trinity, which is Shiva, Brahma, and Vishnu. And just talk about one of the main connections to Christianity is that Krishna and Jesus were either the exact same person in the exact same time, or, or that um, Krishna existed before, and then Jesus was a, a, a complete representation and duplicate of Krishna. The reason why I say that is Krishna had a virgin mother. Krishna had a carpenter dad. Krishna was known as the savior to his people. Krishna was also crucified. Krishna, like everything from Jesus is like Krishna, right? So like, and so what either happened is the universe repeated the same situation again, right? And it came down and did the same exact thing. The son of God came twice and, and has the same story, same mother even, which is weird, same kind of mother energy, right? And same father. So, or Christianity took from a predated um, religion that already had that story and then made up Jesus entirely. And I'm not telling you any of that, which one's true. I'm just telling you that both are plausible. So moving into the Greek and Hindu connection now. And as I was researching this, one day I found a video on the YouTube. It was a 20 minute video comparing Greek and Indian gods. And I was like, Oh my God, every Greek God has an Indian Hindu God. Everyone has a Hindu God. It's the exact same culture. It's the exact same religion. And the Greek um, religion, uh, the Greek um, political system, democracy, religion, stemmed the whole of the Western world and Latin and all of that. And the, and the Indian one really had an effect on the Western world, especially when it comes to Buddhism taking over all these other countries. And it's pretty much... That culture had an effect on every religion and every outcome since then. Because if you think about the number one um, religion on the planet right now, Christianity, it also came from a lot of views that came out of Greek, Greece that went into Egypt, right? And that has a connection to India. So I was like, have we found the source of almost all diversity of religion right now? And it might have stemmed in Mohenjo-daro, but came from Egypt, but came from Atlantis originally. Atlantis to Egypt, to Mohenjo-daro, to the rest of the world. So I started dissecting this a little more, and I found that there are similarities that are beyond belief. For example, Zeus and Indra. They're both the king of the gods. They're both king of sky storms, thunder, lightning, and rain. They use a thunder, they both have a thunderbolt, and they both live on mountains and are promiscuous. Hermes and Narada, both were messengers of the gods, both were tricksters and they created music and they both created the same exact instrument, the lyra. And that was Pythagoras' favorite instrument. The whole entire music scale of the entire planet, Eastern and Western, comes from Pythagoras' work with the lyra. And these are the gods of it from these two cultures. Surya and Helios, sun gods with chariots, Athena and Saraswati. Athena, art and industry, Saraswati, wisdom, music and art. Athena born fully grown in armor, and Saraswati born fully grown from, from someone's mouth. You know, a, too much of a similarity to deny. The list really goes on because I only chose three or four here because of, of time, but really you could keep going on and comparing every single one of them. And I've done two videos on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash portal to ascension, specifically on Greek and Indian gods, the 20 minutes each. So that has a lot of stuff in there as well if you want to go deeper into that. Yeah, you can uh, keep going for as long as you need, uh, Neil. Yeah. There's no rush. Cool, cool. So back to the Americas and the Maya Indian connection. Okay, okay. So I'm saying back to the Americas because I started this whole entire presentation off that we didn't get into about the Americas. And if I end this presentation earlier, I'll go back and do that. But um, I'm, I'm going to Maya now because I'm talking about the India connection and the migration. And now we're talking about the Americas and the influence here from the ancient tribes. And then we see that there's also a connection to the Mohenjo-daro civilization and the individuals in 
that populated the Maya the Maya um, civilization. So there are many similarities in both, and just like in Egyptian culture, for example, there are so many similarities to the Vedic and the Hindu culture because obviously they came from there. But one of them is that many hieroglyphs were actually representations of yoga postures and moves. And there's a whole movement for Kemetic yoga, which is ancient Egyptian yoga. And that's because yoga came from Egypt. <laughs> you know, it's, they didn't make Kemetic yoga up. It's an ancient thing that they got from there. It's not a new thing. And they're now utilizing it. And we have a friend that teaches it. It's called Kemetic yoga. So Neil, is it, uh, I came across some information there uh, a little while back. I think it was in uh, a Hidden History of Humanity where uh, you know, they were talking and they were saying that the yoga was uh, created by the giants so that they can, uh, because they would, they would hurt themselves, right? They would stub their toes and things like that. They couldn't balance so that they created yoga in order to help them to uh, balance their bodies. Is there any truth to that or? Well, there is truth to 15 foot skeletons in Mohenjo-daro. Mm -hmm. So really? yeah, like um, some of those skeletons are huge. And so maybe like if the yoga came there, I, I haven't ever heard of that before, but I'm just telling you that it, that makes sense to me. That could be a possibility, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'll actually uh, forward you that uh, documentary so you can have a look because it talks, uh, a lot about that that yoga was created by the giants and kind of what have you yeah that's very very interesting i've actually never even con contemplated that before so okay many similarities to and connections to mayan culture the forms of yogic philosophy and vedic culture are discovered in both maya and india connection the maya language even when you hear it resonates certain frequencies very similar to ancient sanskrit like when i went there my mind was blown oh the multiple times you've been there my mind is blown pretty much every time someone spoke Maya because of how close it sounds to Sanskrit. And um, for example, the, the I'll give you a hymn in Sanskrit, you know, like the way they announced their, um, their um, syllables, right? Were very much like that and the sounds and vibration that in which they communicated. So, and in Maya, in Hinduism, in Sanskrit, the word Maya means the illusion. And yeah, that's very, yeah, and very interesting. Very, very interesting that uh, you just said that. Uh, again, I'll, I'll go back to what my dad had said. Yeah. Uh, you know, my dad went up to uh, Northwest Territories uh, up here in Canada, and uh, he was speaking, uh, he was listening to the Eskimos uh, talking up there, and he said that he almost understood what they were saying because it almost sounded like that they were speaking like Arabic. Yeah. And uh, you know, we know that Arabic is like part of that Sanskrit language. So that's very interesting that, yes. uh, that you said that. I just wanted to point that out. Yep. So this, this right here has really been my search for the root of all religion. And that's why I've come across this stuff. So the Maya in, in, in Sanskrit, I shouldn't have put Hinduism there, because that's a religion. I mean, Maya in Sanskrit, or Hindi really, means the illusion. And we feel the Maya are the people of the illusion especially the disappearing act that hundreds of thousands of them did at one point. So, mm -hmm. so they represented by that. Now I forgot that I wanted to share something here on the map because what I wanted to do was show you what actually happened after Mahindradaro dispersed. And this is interesting too, because I just did a conference, a two day conference on cannabis, right? And on this conference, I was talking about the migration of cannabis around the world. And as I was doing that, I realized that the same time cannabis left Mohenjo-daro was the same time that Mohenjo-daro seemed to have been um, dissipating and moving down into India. But what looks like occurred is we have a ancient Egypt over here. We have Kush. Um, Omar, Omar, there's a little background noise, brother. I'm sorry. I'm going to uh, mute myself. I got people street sweeping my okay. parking lot here. Okay, thank you, bro. Okay, so they went across here, and Mohenjo-daro dissipated. And what happened to that civilization? They went left and right. They went west and east. Where did they go when they went west? They became the Greeks, the Greek civilizations. Now we see around the exact same time of the dissipation of 
Mahindradaro, not only tribes populating throughout India, but we see Greek culture and civilization and the pantheon of gods in Greece coming along. So this right here is a smoking gun again for me. Like, yeah. this is it. It's happening right there. It's all Mahindradaro, Atlantis, Egypt, Mahindradaro splits up. The Greeks become the Greeks. The Greeks create democracy in the way they do. There's a Senate that's created, and now we're living like the Greeks did, right? Well, technically, we're living like Rome. But yeah, prior to uh, prior to the Greeks, there were the Akkadians. Yep. And uh, the Akkadians were the ones that said that uh, the moon just uh, suddenly showed up one day. I just wanted to point that out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just so it's just so interesting tracking this stuff. Okay, so we're gonna get into now this one. So then now we're going to a different continent entirely. We're we've we're done with the Indian migration and we're gonna go back to the Americas. And there is a difference in North American native awareness compared to South America. Have you noticed at all that almost all great civilizations that were technologically advanced that had supreme pyramid structures, amazing structures, start pretty much at the Mexican border and go down south all the way to South America? But when you start at the US, you have mounds, you have like um, tribal people that look like they were primitive, right? Well, this seems to actually be incorrect. What happened is that they actually was an invested interest. So let's think of this, okay? The Portuguese, the Portuguese and the Spanish predominantly went throughout all of South America. They didn't have, even though they felt that they were better than, they had a completely different perspective of the better than superiority. They actually um, made, um, wives out of some of these um, natives. They um, raped them. They had kids with them, children with them. They did that actively, right? And they did it willingly. So they integrated the culture very, very quickly with the whole of South America. As they were doing that, they also honored, and even though they were like struck by the greatness of straight civilizations like the Inca, like the Aztec, like the Maya, they, were, they, they also... Um, they re re they had reverence for what they had created as well. They weren't trying to destroy it, they just wanted the gold. So that created a whole different mentality of the way South America was and the fact that many ancient structures were not destroyed because of this. Plus, because of the integration at a very early stage, they and even though it was superiority, it was more like, you are now mine, I own you, but you will have my child. That happened quite a lot. <coughs> that these ancient structures pretty much remained main intact, but they did go into the structures and destroy scriptures, evidence of the history, mathematics that they had. They destroyed all of that stuff. So we don't find out too much about what they knew about that. But what happened in the Americas, North America and Canada, what happened? Well, they were like, oh my God, we hate these guys. We don't want anything to do with them. We don't want to integrate with them. Stay in your own area. Stay in your own reservation. Get away from us. Oh, you cannot be as advanced as us. We're going to destroy you. And what did, what happened? great pyramids, entire civilizations, some even that compared to the Maya empire, completely destroyed and devastated. There's a news article from the 1800s that I found through searching through lots of crap on the internet about um, a, an abandoned great civilization that was discovered with multiple pyramids in Northern America in the New England area when it was first inhabited, right? So what did they do? They destroyed them, they tore them down, they completely eradicated their history. So my my argument here is that the whole of the Americas were extremely, extremely, extremely advanced. There were tribes that decided to be less advanced and didn't want to because they wanted to be more connected to the earth. Yes, that happened as well. And there were uh, ones that were more advanced than the others that lived right next to each other. But the structures of South America that we see that are incredible, uh, for example, uh, Machu Picchu, in which the stones below Machu Picchu are more advanced than the stones from the later period of creation, implying that the people who originally made it thousand plus years before the other people were more advanced than the ones in the future, right? When we go to the pyramids, just Chichen Itza, for example, and how incredible the engineering is and how the eye, um, uh, right, for the snake goes up the pyramid for the equinox, right? So all, they had that in North America as well, but it was just kind of like, you know, Push to the side. So I'm saying this was a slide because that's also been on my head for quite some time, and I've 
wanted to speak about it. So I'm trying to bring it into as many presentations as possible, just to know that there was a separationist and superior, a separationist and a superiority of the North and the integration policy of the South, which is why if you go to some countries in South America now, there's still, there's like, um, I forget what country, there's one country, might be Bolivia, where the indigenous tribes are still more than mixed people, right? And there's still tribes in the Amazon that haven't even been touched by the Spanish. Look at North America, right? Look at Canada. It's, it's completely different. So news articles from the latest 1700s, last 1700s and 1800s about advanced structures discovered, great pyramids all over the United States and even in the Grand Canyon. Look on the internet, type in, um, type in pyramid of Sphinx found in Egypt news article. Go to Google Images, look at the images, you'll see it right there. Smithsonian Magazine, 1901, 1903, or something like that, says it there. You talk to them now, you say to them, hey, what happened? With Why is this article out there? They go, we don't know, we have no comment, that never happened. But it's right there. So, and now, and also what is going on in South America compared to North America? In South America, there's excavation, excavation. Have you heard, when's the last time you heard of an actual ancient site, advanced ancient site exca excavation of North America? I'm now putting the word advanced in there, right? Because you see like a little Pueblo excavations that aren't even excavated, it's just a house. There's nothing even excavated, really. There's no civilization underneath that they're pulling out from it. But we see that happening in South America in many countries, except for which countries? The ones with the highest Catholicism rule. The ones with the highest Catholicism rule want to make money off the sites. They want you to go there, but they don't want to excavate because they don't want to find stuff. And that's from my own experience of going down there multiple times. North America was thriving in abundant land with tribal advanced civilizations. Many have been wiped from the face of the earth with little to no evidence of the existence, which is why I put together this presentation because there's so many cultures and tribes in the world that no one will ever talk about. So I did research and in the earlier part of this presentation, I mentioned some really unknown uh, tribes because I wanted to like give, pay homage to our human story in tribes that will never even be talked about before especially in the Americas, like what happened here was so freaking insane, but I guess that's just human nature. We've done that all over. Look what the Romans did, right? It's just a part of our nature. But the fact that like we wiped them from history and now we call them indigenous or natives or native Indians or native Americans, but they all went and had different tribal names. It's just so, it was mind boggling to me. So I wanted to give, pay them homage. So the Aztec creation story. In Aztecs, we have birth, death, and rebirth. We see that in many origin stories, it might be a symbolize, uh, symbolizing reincarnation. When the worlds were destroyed, it's born again through sacrifice of one of the gods. That's what happens. But it's not a story of endless cycle as you may see in other cultures. For the Aztecs, the universe did have an actual beginning. So that's interesting point right there. Many cultures show that even though there was a beginning, there was not really a beginning. But the the Aztecs, they physically believe that there was this beginning. In the beginning was the void. It was, as many, many ancient cultures say, it was some ancient time in the Aztec creation story that the dual god created itself. They saw this world as a world of opposites, good and bad, chaos, order, male and female. Sound familiar? Being male and female, the dual god was able to have children. It had four, which came to represent the four directions of north, south, east, and west. This is very similar to the Greek story as well, but given different names, instead of north, south, east, and west, there were actually four gods, deities, aliens, whatever you want to call them. The directions were very important to the Aztecs, since the great empire was believed to be at the very center of the universe. These four gods began to create. They created water, other gods, and the sea monster, right there is his name. Uh, let's see if I can say that right. Chipakitl, Chipakitl, it's probably close was part fish and part crocodile. Oh, we have a part fish person. Very interesting. That sound shows up a lot of places as well. And a massive creature as big as all things that now are. So moving on to the Hopi. The Hopi believed in the ant people. They said that they were credited, the ant people were credited for saving the Hopi on two different occasions. The so-called first world was destroyed by fire be an ejection from the sun, volcanic eruption, or an asteroid strike, but some sort of fire. The second world was destroyed by ice, perhaps glaciers or a pole shift. In both instances, Hopi legends say the tribe was guided during the day by an odd-shaped cloud and during the night by a moving star. These guides led them to a sky god named Sotoknak, 
who then took them to the ant people. It was in the subterranean caves that the Hopi found refuge during the global cataclysms occurring above, such as the Great Flood was one of these end world scenarios, the Noah's Flood or Gilgamesh's Flood. In this legend, the ant people are seen as generous and hardworking, giving the Hopi Flood and teaching them about food storage when they needed it. Interestingly, the Babylonian sky god was named Anu, also the Hopi world for ant is Naki. So look at this, is the Hopi root word for friends. So the Hopi Anunnaki means ant friends. Many have some correlation with the Sumerian Anunnaki. So detour onto this right here. So they believe that the Anunnaki were everywhere. There's a lot of evidence suggested. Michael Tellen just shows South African um, information and just keeps going on and on. But uh, who was it that we did it? Okay, we did a talk with Freddie Silva a couple of weeks ago. At, three hour presentation with Freddie called Ancient Architects. And in this presentation, he goes that a lot of times when we're talking about reptilians, talking about ants, they, it's, it's a metaphor for the energy because he's done a lot of research to try to see if there's any information to suggest that this is exactly how they look. So there is maybe, you know, I think ant people exist. I do think they're probably in subterranean caves and they could actually be talking about it. But there's also other metaphors and similarities to these words that are being utilized, like reptilian, um, had a serpent, for example, in in Sumerian scriptures, represented wisdom, and some people believe advanced sciences. The ant has three parts to its body. The ant, um, Orion's belt, has three stars within it. So another belief that is also shown in ancient scriptures that also have a connection to Orion is that the end of the beings that came that are represented by ant people also came from Orion because they are metaphorically connected to the fact that the ant has three parts of their body and that connects to the constellation of Orion. Now here's the interesting, well it's all interesting really, but here's the, here's the cool part about ET is always coming back, back down to the ET component of it all. Extraterrestrials and creation stories. So in this presentation I went through about 150 to 180 stories trying to figure out, you know, my battery said it's low. Uh oh, I have 12 minutes on my battery and I have 14, 12 minutes left. I have 12 minutes on my battery and I have 12 minutes left, guys. So, Omar, I'm going to keep going. Right. I'm going to keep going until I end and then just take over, okay? Okay, I got gotcha. you. And uh, right after you're done, I'm going to uh, bring Steve Needs on. This actually kind of works out just perfect because I was just looking at the clock as well. So, uh, I think the universe is just working with us, brother. That's funny, dude. <laughs> That's hilarious, brother. Hurry up, go before you die. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> ETs and creation stories. Okay. Or star beings, interdimensional travelers, other humanoids. Many creation stories speak of beings that are not from our planet. Is this myth or could this actually have existed? that we see you know, beings in the Greek text, we see them in Hindu, we see them in the Bible, Egyptian, the Dogon. The Dogon actually talk about beings coming from Sirius, right? The indigenous tribes in Americas, Celtic, Norse, Hopi, all ancient pagan cultures seem to have it, and modern cultures seem to have taken from those. And then if you do a simple search of cultures, uh, ancient civilizations that believe they came from the Pleiades, go to the Wikipedia page and look at the hundreds of them over there. Right. So they all feel like there's some sort of connection there. It's inevitable to it's an undeniable at this point. Evidence suggests that monotheistic cultures came from a belief systems originally that they had multiple gods. It looks like a, like a lot of monotheistic religions, as Paul said yesterday, that meant the powerful ones, that one out of all the powerful ones were selected, that there were multiple gods and then they chose to select one god at a time. That might even be connected to the zodiac cycle and every 2,000 years how we almost have a different main religion on the planet. So there's definitely um, a lot of information that suggests that monotheistic cultures just selected the one god out of the many. And when it comes to Hebrew, it's talking about Yahweh. Could these be extraterrestrials? Too many of these beings actually exist uh, to many, these beings actually existed or exist and are literal physical gods. Is this concept easier to digest than the possible of alien life? Right? So are these gods that were doing this stuff? Because these gods seem like they were vengeful, drama-filled gods. It seems like we portrayed every human characteristic on them. So when they created us in their image, did they create us with all these traits that they had? Or were they divine messengers of God? Or were they star beings that had advanced technology and had consider them gods or a combination of all of this. I think it's a combination of all. 
having been isolated on this planet for so long that we are too indoctrinated in the concept of a god that we do not see blatant evidence that these gods and angels could be more technologically advanced beings. The Hindu scriptures, especially the Mahabharata, shows depictions of celestial craft and chariots with lightning bolts coming out of them. It is also believed that the Mahabharata could have been a battle that took place in Atlantis, or the Mahabharata could have been the battle that actually took place in Mohenjo-daro that created all the nuclear radiation fallout there. Now I'm going to end on these right here, UFO and ancient art. Just some images of UFOs and ancient art. Some cool, beautiful images. And we have like this craft in there, Jesus being crucified, going with the other side. Got this one right here, we have a some some type of, I guess, whether it's alien or not, it's a UFO because it's un unidentified to me, right? So it's a unidentified object right there, shining down to this person's third eye, crown chakra. Where is it going? It's going somewhere into that head. And then we have this UFO-like thing right here, sending some ray down to, that looks like it might be John the Baptist or something like that going on over there. Renaissance art right here, some structure above this house, maybe an ET abduction, who knows? And then Mayan art. This is a very interesting one. Look at these beans. Elongated skull. Pyramid. 